Gus Simmons is our, our next presenter. He is the director of bioenergy and a partner in Kavanaugh Associates. So uh, this morning I'm going to spend a few minutes talking with you about some of the market drivers that are affecting some of the application of all the great work that you folks in the room are doing uh, to uh, help extract a portion of the value chain associated with agricultural waste. And that's relative to some of the value we place on the energy aspects of that value chain and the sustainability aspects of that value chain. So uh, this morning I'm going to uh, just share with you a little bit of information uh, about uh, how that applies here in North Carolina since we're, we're here for the conference. Uh, take an opportunity to share a bit more about some of the uh, things that are going on here in this state that will build upon some of the things that you've heard in, in previous presentations throughout the week. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the drivers are, uh, why are we beginning to see a shift in uh, some of the application of value chain extraction for energy and sustainability, uh, which includes the resource drivers, the economic drivers, and the policy drivers, of course. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that have been done recently, uh, some things we're doing now, and get wrapped up. So, I always want to start with the why. Why is this important? Uh, so how many of you folks saw, uh, it was probably about two weeks ago, uh, there was a press release that came out about this ongoing discussion in North Carolina about combined heat and power plants and universities. Anybody see that? There's one person in the room, so, okay, there's two or three. All right. <laughs> so I, I got to tell you real quick, this was a lifesaver for me because I was uh, given a similar presentation at BioCycle, which is a biogas, bioenergy based presentation. And I was sort of struggling with how to explain the why. And I woke up that morning before the presentation and that newspaper article came out. Uh, and so I got to insert it into the presentation sort of like I did today. But what it was is uh, Duke University, one of the private universities here in North Carolina, has been having this ongoing discussion and really a, a very rigorous debate in the community about installing a combined heat and power plant. Like a lot of universities and maybe some of the ones that you folks are, are affiliated with, they have a coal-fired power plant uh, that produces heat for their steam plant or produces electricity. Uh, it's become aged and we're trying to move away from coal and so uh, their plan was to replace that coal-fired plant with a combined heat and power plant fired from natural gas. Seeming to think natural gas has a better fuel supply and has a little bit better carbon footprint. Certainly the economics are a lot better and uh, it created actually quite a stir uh, because a lot of the folks in the community said, whoa, wait up. It's still a fossil-derived fuel source, and so we think we can do a lot better. We need to look towards uh, renewable energy to supply uh, what those needs are. So they actually, uh, through this debate, have uh, come out, and uh, that university has made a commitment to move ahead with, uh, with uh, using biogas uh, to satisfy their energy needs. Uh, not only uh, moving ahead, but they have recently committed to power their university need with 100% biogas, renewable natural gas. Uh, and they further went on to say that they believe day one, when they open that facility, that they can uh, acquire enough biogas to uh, be carbon neutral with the operation of that facility. Now, I see all of your faces. That's a really big, hairy statement to make, right? Being able to supply all of your power from biogas. So that's, a, uh, that's one of the big reasons why so much of this discussion is going on. And it's not just Duke University. We, uh, there's actually other universities. Uh, let me just ask, how many of you uh, from university are having this ongoing discussion about how you're generating power? Yeah, there's six or eight that I know of in the, in the country that are really beginning to have this very rigorous debate over how they're going to supply heat and power to their university. It's not just the university system. We're seeing it in manufacturing. We're seeing it in industry. Uh, we're seeing uh, across the country really this push uh, to leverage our interest in using natural gas to advance our ability to act, extract value out of the waste stream at, uh, for agricultural projects. So it's a pretty interesting stuff. So I'm going to get into a little bit of the resources now. So you've heard uh, a couple of times since you're here this week, I'm, I'm sure that North Carolina is a, uh, is a very... Uh, biomass, bioenergy resource rich state. Uh, North Carolina is known for a lot of things. We've been known for basketball, we've been known for bathrooms, uh, we're also known for uh, agriculture. It's actually the largest portion, largest driver in our economy. Uh, and so we've got these really robust, rich bioenergy making uh, resources in our state, uh, as you can see uh, depicted in these uh, couple of graphs. 
Uh, so the one on the left is one you've probably seen many times from NREL. And just to point out, you know, North Carolina, you've, you've heard it a couple of times, we're known as the third richest bioenergy potential state in the country. Uh, and if you look at that, uh, I don't know how many of you are very familiar with the geography of the states and what the, the borders look like. It really spans the entire state. It's uh, the only state in the country, in my opinion, that the uh, resources span from border to border everywhere. So it's really a, a tremendous opportunity here in, uh, in this state to, uh, to make good on these really rich resources. If it was gold or silver or possibly uh, uh, oil, we would be uh, tripping over ourselves to try to figure out how to make good on that resource. So uh, that's been what's leading to uh, a lot of the work that's been done. And so really how that's come together, uh, we also have uh, a tremendous amount of solar development in the state of North Carolina. We're top five-ish, you know, depending on who you ask and what year it is. We've been from fourth to eighth and back up to fifth. Uh, but we have a lot of solar uh, energy that's here. Uh, we are starting to get, uh, we're second in the state now. Uh, thank you very much. So we're doing a little bit better there than I thought. We also uh, are uh, advancing our, our wind uh, energy systems. Uh, and uh, you've probably seen some of the uh, news about the Amazon facility. Uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, hydroelectric facilities in the state uh, using uh, dammed up water to generate electricity. So we actually have a, a pretty, uh, pretty diverse uh, group of renewable energy resources, but this huge opportunity for agriculture and the agricultural waste stream. And I'm not talking about just manures. I'm talking about crop residues, food waste, everything associated with that whole value chain uh, is really starting to, to, get, to really take hold in our state. And uh, you've heard folks say all week long that we've been working on this for 20 years, which is a really long time. Uh, and we're finally beginning to see some of these systems come out of the ground and, and make good on all this. So some of the economic drivers, there's one that I think is really, really important. Anybody guess which one that is? Uh, so there's a lot of economic drivers that are coming to play here. Cost of waste disposal, certainly that's a big, big issue in the New, in the New England states and the Northeast, uh, where landfill space has become such a premium. So t our typical disposal practices are becoming expensive. That is a behavior changer. When it costs you a lot more to manage your waste, you begin to uh, think more conservatively about how you can recycle that waste. Uh, cost of energy, uh, you know, here in the Southeast, the energy is pretty cheap. In fact, it's dirt cheap. Uh, but in other parts of the, uh, the country, other parts of the world, that's been a big driver as to why we are uh, uh, extracting these values out of the waste stream. Consumer choice and premium, I think, is a, is a really, really key one. And you're seeing now uh, consumers, large consumers of energy products or from fertilizers, things of that nature, they're willing to pay more for these products. But they, they've got to be given security and assurance that what they're paying for is what they're asking for. Uh, and so we're seeing consumer choice and premium actually drive the market price up for these energy products and sustainability projects, products from agriculture. Uh, economic growth and sustainability, obviously all of this is new infrastructure, new things that create jobs. It creates new revenues on farms, gives a reason to reinvest in the farming community, and that's huge. You know, particularly in our state that uh, has such a large uh, portion of its economy driven by agriculture. Some of the regulatory drivers, I'm going to hit briefly, you guys already know this. Uh, you know, North Carolina is one of uh, 29 states that has a renewable energy portfolio standard. You've heard all about that. We have to make part of our electricity from swine waste and poultry waste. Quite honestly, that hasn't resulted in a lot. And the reason being is it's not a transparent market. Uh, let me ask, who in here knows what the price of a swine renewable energy credit is? Anybody? If you did and you said it, you'd probably be escorted out of here by the police. And all those uh, prices are negotiated under confidentiality. So it's not a transparent market. Anytime you don't have a transparent market, you cannot expect that market to grow on its own. You can't expect it to grow organically because every single project is in sort of negotiated as a one-off. Alternately, if you compare that to the renewable fuel standard, am I getting in front of the, okay. if, you get, if you compare that to the renewable fuel standard, which is the federal standard that requires uh, part of our transportation fuels to come from renewable sources, that's an extremely transparent market. And that has been a driver for a lot of uh, agricultural waste derived fuels to, uh, to move into the marketplace. And we're beginning to see more and more effort uh, put in place to try to normalize this national market for other forms of energy for uh, coming from uh, agricultural wastes. So that's enough of the uh, front end stuff. I'll go ahead and move into a little bit about what's been done. And you've heard a lot, and a lot of you folks know much more than I do, about some of the previous work and studies that have been done. You've heard this week about the Smithfield study that was done 
back at the turn of the millennium, lots of studies that have been done and, and technology evaluations. Since my presentation is specifically about moving into the pipeline, and I'll sort of get to the punchline with that here in a moment, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the work that's been done relative to uh, trying to get some of these energy resources into the pipeline where you have access to very broad and diverse markets. So one of those was a study that was done by Duke University that was released back in 2013. Uh, I'm pointing back to this because this ultimately led to their confidence in being able to make the statement, we're going to power ourselves with 100% biogas. So you can sort of drill it back down to some of this work that was done several years ago. And in this case, they were looking at what are some of the more efficient ways for us to bring some of these energy products to the market. We had uh, somewhere around four or five uh, anaerobic digester projects on uh, farms in the state at that point in time. They were all generating electricity on farm. The economics were really, really tough. Uh, those uh, on-site generators are pretty doggone inefficient, quite honestly. Uh, even the most efficient ones are significantly less efficient than a conventional power plant. So trying to compete with a very large electric utility on their very low cost of electricity is pretty doggone tough. So it, it's hard to make those economics work. So uh, this was a, an evaluation to try to find ways to overcome those economies of scale. And they really began looking at uh, what if we use this pipeline infrastructure that we've got that, allows, that would allow farms to uh, put in place uh, organic waste conversion technologies like anaerobic digesters or pyrolysis or gasification and put that uh, energy product into the pipeline so that now we can serve customers in North Carolina, but now also you can uh, serve customers out of state. So imagine, analogy, uh, if, you, uh, you know, if you would compare uh, being a, a small uh, uh, homestead or farm and you're selling all of your products that you produce on your farm at the farm gate. You know, you gotta have people that sort of ride by and want to buy those products and know where you are and how to seek you out versus the way that we actually put food on the table today with modern agricultural systems that sort of use a pipeline of trucks and retailers and distributors to get that food from the farm to your table. So some of the same concept of how do we get these energy products and sustainability products commercially moved into the marketplace where those consumers desire them. And what they really looked at was comparing the costs and the deployment opportunities of those on-farm systems to uh, large centralized digesters and then to a couple of different versions of how you could, instead of generating electricity with generators, put renewable natural gas into the pipeline. And they came up with this concept that there's a really good opportunity. There was hope, at least, that using the pipeline infrastructure and generating renewable natural gas would be a mechanism to compete on a cost-effective basis. Now, that study, if you uh, have a chance to look at it, there's a lot of variables that we could debate for quite a long time. The good news about that is those variables are the same through all those analyses. So, uh, for instance, if you wanted to debate the cost of electricity as an example, what it would be in your state versus our state, that cost is, uh, is a variable that's common to all four of those analyses. So you can cancel that variable out and the relative comparison is still good. So uh, from a relative basis, there was a lot of hope that was presented in that. And then comparing those options of the on-farm digesters to uh, some of the, uh, the more centralized systems, we really began to run into a bit of trouble over the cost of some of the more challenging aspects of putting these systems on the grounds that, that project developers have run into. I mean, one of them is the cost of biosecurity. And that's something that we've all in this room talked a good deal about is, you know, how do you go get products from, from many different farms and bring them to a centralized facility uh, and not, uh, you know, run into the potential of moving things you don't want to move around from farm to farm. Uh, you've got these huge costs of scale, and these huge costs of inefficiency. And that hope translated into the opportunity to find ways to overcome those challenges. And so my little balloons on both sides of the scale was this belief that we were on the verge of learning ways that we could overcome some of these cost issues. So what, it, what that has meant and what is being done now, uh, there's actually uh, two projects in the state of North Carolina that have been approved to put agriculturally derived renewable natural gas into the natural gas pipeline and deliver those to customers. And that's really a groundbreaking thing for North Carolina because there has never been any natural gas from any source ever put into the North Carolina pipeline. 
we buy all of our natural gas from the United States. So we're a net energy sink here. Uh, we don't produce any of that ourselves. So one of those projects was the Carbon Cycle Energy Project. It was the first. Uh, you may have seen uh, the, this press release that I've got on the screen that came out from Duke Energy. Duke Energy is buying that gas from the Carbon Cycle Project once it begins putting gas into the pipeline uh, to simply displace a portion of the natural gas they use at a combined cycle plant uh, to generate electricity. One huge advantage of that is the carbon neutrality aspects of that because when we when we uh, generate uh, electricity on a farm and you capture the methane potential uh, through an anaerobic digester or a covered lagoon, you create a methane uh, emission reduction carbon credit. We're all familiar with that, right? When instead you capture that methane and put it into a natural gas pipeline and don't generate electricity uh, on site, you get the carbon capture credit that we all know and love. You also get a fuel switch credit, meaning you're displacing the natural gas that's being used that combined cycle plant. So it actually provides you some net benefit on carbon neutrality that you may not otherwise get. Uh, the second project is one that's called Optima KV. Uh, it's a project that, uh, that I'm involved in. It's about uh, 80,000 decatherms a year that comes from five uh, swine farms that are adjacently located. And each of those farms has an in-ground anaerobic digester uh, installed. So just giving you a little bit of a snapshot of what that looks like. Uh, those five farms will all connect up and put uh, renewable natural gas into a pipeline that will be directed to a uh, natural gas combined cycle plant owned by Duke Energy in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is pretty close to where I live. Um, just very briefly how it works, uh, using an in-ground uh, ambient temperature digester, so it looks a lot like a covered lagoon, just works a little bit more like a digester. Uh, we dry the gas at each one of those digesters. We aggregate the raw biogas to a centralized facility where it's then refined and purified to renewable natural gas quality. And what that prompted, you know, as we, as we continue to move through these iterations of how we get these value, valuable products into the marketplace, what we learned is that natural gas is not natural gas is not natural gas. The standards for natural gas vary depending on which pipeline you're connected to. Sometimes they vary quite a bit even within the same state. And we've seen that happen in California. Somebody was here from California earlier um, where uh, the quality of that natural gas can vary quite a bit. So what that resulted in is uh, meanwhile, while these projects are under construction, uh, our state has filed a uh, renewable natural gas specification. And that specification is currently being debated. and It's not yet been approved. It's just simply pending. Uh, and what that does is it defines what the qualitative aspects of renewable natural gas should be for these agricultural projects uh, to get their gas into the pipeline system. And so just to give you a, a little bit of a, a snapshot of what that looks like, in that, spec in that proposed specification that's pending, uh, we uh, are having an ongoing discussion about what those quality characteristics of renew renewable natural gas should be. So over here on, the, uh, on your left uh, is what the proposed specification is. And on the right is a national proposed specification that's been proposed by the American Biogas Council. Uh, and just to give you some brief comparisons. So actually, they're pretty close. There's a few things that are different here or there, but the good news is, is it's relatively close to some of the work that's been done proposing that natural, uh, national natural gas specification. Uh, there is uh, a group of folks that have intervened in that and are uh, trying to help our state get to a better resolution that you can see over here on the far right of the slide. So with that, I'm out of time, so I'm finishing on my last slide. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity just to share a little bit about some of the work that's being done here to move that, uh, uh, those agricultural derived products, renewable natural gas, some of the environmental attributes that go along with that into the marketplace using the pipeline. I'm happy to hang around and talk if you want to learn more about some of the stuff that's been done. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Yes, we do. We do have time for one or two quick questions. Okay. Have one in the corner here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, last project you were talking about, with the five digesters or type of natural gas down the building. Right. How far is that pipeline? In, uh, I mean, how did that become a pipeline? You need to find that pipeline itself. It takes that out of uh, contention. Yeah. So it's the cost of building pipeline, particularly interconnecting the pipeline. Oh, I see. Really, really high. So the Thank way you. that it actually gets to the power plant is through the process of nomination. Okay. Uh, so if you can think of the pipeline as this huge lake, uh, and you're putting water in the lake on one side, and I'm taking water out on the other, 
doesn't necessarily mean that I, you know, there's sort of a virtual part that connects us to. I can buy your water, it goes into the lake and I extract it on the other side, I'm still buying your water. So that's the way that it works. We actually put the natural gas in uh, about 60 miles away from the power plant. They're extracting natural gas uh, where they are today. It may not be the same gas molecule, in fact it's probably not the same gas molecule, but on a volumetric basis they're buying the amount that we're putting in, so they're buying that gas. So the utility pipeline from our project is 50 feet because uh, everything before that is non-utility pipeline, which is much less expensive to, to build. Once it goes through our compressor station, we have to pressurize it to 960 PSI, it literally crosses the easement and goes into the, the uh, natural gas pipeline that's there. So that's the key to it. If you've yeah. got to run miles and miles of pipe, it's never going to be cost effective. Yeah. Great question.